Thanks, Karina, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, okay, so as Karina mentioned, I'll be talking about our regulatory position on glyphosate. Um, I'll start with an introduction of roughly, uh, basically what glyphosate is um, and what the problem is, why I'm talking to you about it today, and I'll go through a number of um, international assessments that have been conducted about glyphosate recently, um, as well as our own assessment. So um, glyphosate is an analogue of glycine, which is a naturally occurring amino acid. It's a broad spectrum, non-selective herbicide. It's a systemic herbicide, and it's really commonly used to control all sorts of weeds, um, annual, perennial, um, broadleaf and grassy weeds, in um, home gardens, commercial settings, um, public areas, and um, in agriculture. It is... Um, taken up by the leaves and all of the green parts of the plant, so not the roots, um, and it's translocated systemically throughout the plant to kill the entire plant. It acts by disrupting the shikimic acid pathway um, by preventing the plant from generating essential amino acids that are required for protein biosynthesis, and this pathway is unique to, to plants, so it's not present in um, mammals. <laughs> The ADI in Australia is 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day, and that is based on the NOEL of 30 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day, um, which was generated um, in a third generation rat study at the highest dose tested um, using a 100 fold <laughs> safety factor. The acute toxicity of glyphosate is very low. You can see there the um, oral and dermal LD50s and the inhalational LC50. And because of that low um, acute toxicity, an acute reference dose has not been set, and it's been scheduled as a Schedule 5 um, chemical, which is reflected on product labels. There are a number of different glyphosate products registered for use in Australia in different formulations. Um, often glyphosate is formulated as one of its salts to increase water solubility, and a lot of the formulated products contain various non-ionic surfactants to um, facilitate uptake by the plants and a really common one is the polyethoxylated taloamine um, which has also generated a bit of um, media and public interest recently. Um, some of the products may not actually contain the surfactants but they may recommend mixing the glyphosate product with a surfactant prior to use so it's quite common to have that um, glyphosate surfactant combination. Um, they're formulated as various um, different products. So we have solutions, granules, aerosols and gels, and they can be applied by either ground applications, so ground booms, knapsacks, hand sprays, um, things like that, as well as aerial equipment. Um, when I put this slide together, we had about 80 active constituent approvals and about, I say about, it sounds very specific, 471 registered products. Um, and they're sort of split between home garden products, products registered for commercial or agricultural uses, and then some products that are registered for um, all three of, or, or a combination of those uses. So the problem that we faced was that in 2015, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, reclassified glyphosate as a group two um, carcinogen, so probably carcinogenic to humans. Um, the IARC is, um, a subsidiary of the World Health Organization, but they have their own governing council and their own scientific council, so they do operate somewhat, somewhat autonomously from the WHO. <laughs> and their role is to evaluate cancer hazards. Um, I'll go into the difference between the hazards and the risks later. I'm assuming a lot of you probably already know it, but for some people who um, maybe aren't familiar with the differences, I'll go through that later. And they assess their cancer hazards using a strength of evidence approach, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. In order to do their assessments, they um, usually access publicly available information. So they'll look at publicly available peer-reviewed research papers and government reports. So it's quite unusual for them to have access to the raw data. They do sometimes access that data. And when they're looking at the public, uh, publicly available information, they just have access to those documents. So they won't have the associated um, raw data with those papers. So IARC can um, classify a chemical or a sort of scenario into one of five groups. Group one is the highest rating, which is carcinogenic to humans. Um, and then we have probably, possibly not classifiable, due, generally due to a lack of data. 
or probably not carcinogenic. And the first thing you may notice is they don't actually have one for definitely not carcinogenic. Um, and if you want more information about how they come to these classifications, how they define them, um, you can find it on their website in the preamble and there's a link to that in the slide. Um, and I've also taken a screenshot. I took this about a year ago and I think they've assessed a few more chemicals since then, so the figures aren't 100% accurate, but it's a rough idea. They've assessed around about 1,000 um, agents and um, you can see the majority of them here are actually not classifiable. Um, so about half of them they've listed as not classifiable. And then we have um, about just under 300 listed as group 2B or possibly carcinogenic. 79 as probably carcinogenic, and that's the group glyphosate's in. Um, 118 as definitely carcinogenic, and just one as probably not. And I always forget what it is, but I made a note to look it up again in the lunch break, and it's caprolactin, caprolactam, which is a precursor to nylon 6. So that's the only one they've ever listed as probably not carcinogenic. Um, so, obviously, um, the media reporting that they have listed uh, glyphosate as a group to probable carcinogen generated a lot of concern, which is fair enough in the, in the public domain. People get very scared. But to put that into a little bit of perspective, I've got a few other things that people are generally fairly commonly exposed to that they either don't see as a particular concern or, in some cases, you know, it's um, something that they actually want to be exposed to, like consumption of red meat if you're not a vegetarian. So we have glyphosate, obviously, um, and it's in the same group as things like indoor emissions from wood combustion or having a wood fire, um, high temperature frying, um, exposure to chemicals um, by hairdressers and painters, consumption of red meat and uh, disruption of the circadian rhythm, which um, they lift as at least as shift work, but I suspect that also applies to anybody who has children. <laughs> so that's most of us. Well, not me, but, you know. Um, and then... In group one, which is the highest ranking they can give to a chemical or an agent, we have alcohol. Don't see a public social media campaign to ban alcohol, by the way. Um, diesel engine exhaust, consumption of processed meat, so bacon and things like that. Postmenopausal hormone therapy, um, oral contraceptives, soot and wood dust. Um, the other thing I find quite interesting about this, not long after the glyphosate um, monograph was published, they also published their monograph about um, processed meat and red meat. So there was a little bit of a media flurry about how they've also listed these um, things as, as carcinogens. And it got dismissed fairly quickly by people saying, oh yes, but you'd have to eat so much of it. And I find it really interesting that people can dismiss that because it's something they want. Whereas with glyphosate, they're not able to say, oh yes, but you'd probably have to be exposed to a lot of it. Um, there seems to be that you know, distinction that people are able able to make. And my favourite um, thing, actually, sorry to go a little bit off topic, but there was a suggestion that the reason that meat is carcinogenic is because the cows are eating grass that's been sprayed with glyphosate. <laughs> I'm not sure entirely how that works, mostly because the grass would be dead, so it wouldn't be able to eat it, but that was one suggestion. So all of this led to an awful lot of media attention and public interest. There were a lot of, was a lot of information going around on social media, um, a lot of um, news articles, a lot of pressure on local councils to stop using glyphosate. A lot of people were very scared to take their children into public areas. The people working for the councils were fairly understandably concerned because they're the ones who are actually using the glyphosate. There were reports that it was being found in food and in breast milk and all sorts of things um, overseas. Um, the study, for anyone who's not aware, um, that was conducted by Mums Across America and Sustainable Pulse was largely discredited because of the, the fact they didn't validate the ELISA that they were using to actually test the um, breast milk and they didn't, didn't store the samples properly and things like that. And another study was conducted later where they actually did um, collect samples correctly and use a validated test and they didn't find any residues, but that was this sort of well, dismissed by the public because um, they did it in conjunction with Monsanto because they had to get access to the glyphosate. Um, and then there was the incident in Bristol in the UK where they stopped using glyphosate altogether and now they're just using vinegar. So apparently Bristol smells like a chip shop <laughs> and I'm assuming is becoming riddled with weeds fairly quickly. Um, there's also been a lot of... Um, this has led to an awful lot of 
glyphosate causes everything, um, sorts of things. And, and the top slide I've got, or um, graph I've got here, um, that hasn't actually come from a scientific study. It came from two studies where someone has taken a graph of the use of glyphosate and a graph of the incidence of autism and superimposed one on top of the other and said, well, here we have a correlation. Um, but if you go to the Spurious Correlations website, you can find that most things will correlate with something. For example, the number of people who die from becoming tangled in their bed sheets correlates quite nicely with cheese consumption. <laughs> so, obviously, we have to be aware that correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation and use a more, slightly more scientific approach. However, I've actually started to get a little bit convinced by this cheese thing because I realise people say don't eat cheese before you go to bed because you'll have bad nightmares. <laughs> so maybe it's true. <laughs> maybe it does cause people to die from becoming tangled in their bed sheets. So anyway, as, on a slightly more serious note, um, that also led to an awful lot of public pressure to ban glyphosate across the world, particularly in Europe, where they happened to unfortunately be at the tail end of their sort of routine re-registration uh, re re process for glyphosate. And a number of, um, of the environment members of the um, European Parliament have repeatedly voted not to renew the registration of glyphosate because of mounting public pressure. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, uh, it's sort of become a very um, politicised topic. So if you want to have a look at the assessment of glyphosate by IARC, you can find the monograph on their website um, via that link. Um, they classified glyphosate in Group 2A because they found there was limited evidence for carcinogenicity to humans, but sufficient evidence of carcinogenicity in experimental animals. And if you look at their definitions for how they came to that conclusion, um, as far as humans go, their criteria for listing as limited evidence is that there is a credible causal link identified, but that chance, bias or confounding factors can't be ruled out. So they said that there was, they had seen a positive association with non-Hodgkin lymphoma, um, but these confounding factors um, can't be ruled out, there's not enough data. Their criteria for listing something as sufficient evidence in experimental animals is that a causal relationship needs to be identified and, I'm sorry for reading this out, but there has to be increased incident, or they need to identify an increased incidence of malignant neoplasms or an appropriate combination of benign and malignant neoplasms established in either two or more species or in two or more independent studies in one species. So I mentioned before about the strength of evidence um, assessment approach and that's where this comes in. So basically if you have 100 studies and 98 of them say there's no association, but two of them in one species say that there is an association, in a strength of evidence um, assessment you would say, well, there is sufficient evidence because we've got these two studies. In a weight of evidence assessment, which is what risk regulators use, we would say, okay, the majority of the evidence says there is no association. So we're going to look at more detail at these two studies and try to work out why they're different before we start saying there is sufficient evidence for carcinogenicity. Um, so if we have a look at their assessment of the epidemiology data, for those of you who don't have a, um, a lot of experience assessing um, epidemiology data like this, Three of the sort of main things you would look at, obviously there's a lot of things you'd look at in an epidemiology study, but the three main things to look at here are the N number or the sample size, which obviously the larger the sample size the better. The risk ratio or the odds ratio, which is an indication of the likelihood of the um, agent causing the, um, the outcome. And what you, when you look at this, if the risk ratio or odds ratio is one, it indicates there's no difference between groups. If it's less than one, it may indicate, for example, that glyphosate prevents cancer. Um, if it's greater than one, it may indicate that glyphosate causes cancer. But the other thing to look at is 95% confidence interval. So if, and that is an indication of the precision of that data and the precision of that um, prediction. So if the um, confidence interval is narrow, it indicates good precision and you can have a um, reasonable um, assurance in that data. If it's wide, it indicates there's an awful lot of individual variation, so maybe the data is not so reliable. And if it spans one, so if it goes from 0.8 to 1.3, it's generally considered that it indicates there is no difference between the two groups. 
So the largest study that IARC relied on was the study conducted in the US, which was a prospective study, and it's the agricultural health study, where they looked at just over 54,000 um, licensed pesticide users and found no association between glyphosate exposure and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. The rest of the studies were smaller studies. You can see they used smaller sample sizes um, and they sort of were spread out over the US, Canada and Europe. Um, when I've got the little E or C, that's exposed cases or controls. So you can see some of them have only used four exposed cases or um, two or three controls. And you can see that the, um, the odds ratios or risk ratios in this column, most of them are sort of around one. The ones that are slightly increased, so around um, two or three, um, if you have a look at the 95% confidence intervals for those, most of them are either quite wide, indicating poor precision, or they span one, which means there's actually no difference between two groups, or both of those things. So um, the IARC has looked at this data and determined that these results indicate limited evidence for carcinogenicity in humans. They also reported an increased risk of my multiple myeloma, which is a related um, cancer in three studies. However, if you look at the actual studies, none of them actually adjusted for the use of other pesticides. The results were not significant um, and poor, uh, poor precision was demonstrated in all of them. When they looked at the carcinogenicity in experimental animals, they had seven dietary studies, um, two in mice and five in rats, and one um, dietary water study of a formulated um, product in rats. In mouse, they found or reported a positive trend in the incidence of renal uh, carcinomas and combination of adenomas carcinomas in males but not in females, and an increased trend for hemangiosarcomas in males but not females, but no dose response was reported. In rats, three of the dietary studies and the drinking study, drinking water study all found there was no effect, um, and in the other um, studies, they did find or reported an increased incidence of pancreatic um, adenomas and hepatocellular adenomas in males and in thyroid C-cell adenomas in females, but again, no dose response was reported. The other thing to keep in mind here with these studies is that a lot of those studies actually um, analysed the data using a pairwise comparison, so looking at one animal versus another animal, um, and reported that there was no difference between the two groups. And in IARC's assessment, what they did was actually took those numbers from those papers and reanalyzed them using a trend um, method and reported a positive trend. However, they didn't actually have access to the original data, so they were just using the pooled data that was in those papers. So in some cases, they were criticised by the authors of those papers for misinterpreting their data. They also looked at genotoxicity and also oxidative um, stress. For the genotoxicity studies, um, I've got here the majority of studies reported DNA damage. That should actually say that they investigated DNA damage. So it reads a little bit like they all found evidence for DNA damage, but actually that was what they generally used as their endpoint for the study. And DNA damage is generally considered to be a secondary effect of genotoxicity because it may also be indicative of cytotoxicity if you use the agent at high enough concentrations. Now, these studies produced varying results. When they saw positive results, they were often at the highest concentration only, which was often over the recommended threshold concentration listed by the OECD, and there was no concentration-related increase. For example, um, five, five out of nine studies um, reported chromosomal damage, but three of those five studies only tested one dose, so it's not possible to determine if there was a dose response. Another study reported a positive effect only at the highest concentration tested, and a final study reported a positive effect only at the lowest dose con um, tested. So again, no dose response um, is, is evident. Some studies also looked at the effects of a single intraperitoneal dose of glyphosate, um, and no effects were found in, in one study, but increased chromosomal aberrations in a dose-dependent manner were reported in the other, but in that study, they do, they dissolved the glyphosate in DMSO, which is known to um, be more genotoxic than water, which is what you would normally dissolve it in. There was only one um, test that used a single oral dose, which is more realistic for human exposure, um, and that found no effect. And then there was one study, 
um, that found chromosomal damage in blood and increased DNA damage in members of the community following four or two, four or two months following spraying. Um, but obviously in a study like that, there's an awful lot of um, other confounding factors that would need to be taken into account. So if I move on now to the international assessments of glyphosate, um, it's been reported in the media that some countries or some regulators have banned glyphosate, but no international regulatory body has done that um, following the IARC reclassification. In some countries, there's been a retail decision to um, restrict the sale of glyphosate um, or remove it entirely. And in the EU, whilst the European Commission um, is in charge of regulating the chemicals, it's up to the member states to actually implement that. So they can make a decision not to authorise the use of glyphosate in their country if they want to, but it's not actually a regulatory decision. Um, the JMPR has assessed glyphosate a number of times, most recently um, earlier this year, and the, um, it has been assessed in Europe by the European Food Safety Authority and the European Chemicals Agency. Health Canada, US EPA, and the New Zealand EPA. So before I talk about them, I'll jump back to the hazard versus risk in a chemical um, assessment. So IARC utilise a hazard-based assessment where you're looking at the potential for a chemical to cause harm, in this case, cancer, but you don't take into account the exposure scenario. Whereas regulators um, usually use a risk-based assessment where we look at the hazard and the exposure. So the best example I've found of this is if you're standing on a beach and there's a shark in the ocean, the shark presents a hazard, but you're at a very low risk of getting eaten by that shark if you're sitting on the beach. As soon as you swim out into the water and you start swimming around near this shark, your risk of being eaten by the shark increases. But we don't say, oh, well, we're going to get rid of all the sharks just you know, because they present a, an inherent risk or a hazard. Um, the other thing that regulators do is we look at the risk um, the hazard and exposure and we determine can we reduce your exposure to this hazard and therefore reduce the risk of it causing you harm. So for example, if you're laying on the beach in the sun, the sun presents a hazard to you that you might get sunburned. But if you put up a shade umbrella or put some sun cream or a long sleeve shirt and a hat on, you're reducing your exposure to that ha hazard and therefore reducing the risk that it's going to harm you. Um, I also utilise a strength of evidence <coughs> approach, which I talked about before, um, which basically looks at any sort of evidence as being, um, you know, whether, regardless of whether it agrees with the majority or the quality of that evidence. In a weight of evidence um, approach, you would assess the number of studies that um, present the same conclusion, and you would also assess the quality of those studies to determine whether they were reliable or not. So the JMPR um, is jointly administered by the WHO and the Food and Agriculture Organisation of the United Nations, and they meet annually to discuss the safety of pesticides and set health-based guidance values for trade. Following the IARC classification, they um, called a, an extraordinary meeting of the JMPR and recommended a full review of glyphosate, diazinon and malathion, which were included in the same monograph. And they met in May of this year when Matt was at that meeting. Um, and they concluded that there was some, some evidence for an association between glyphosate and NHL risk, noting that the only large um, prospective cohort study found no association at any exposure level. It was unlikely to be genotoxic at anticipated dietary exposure levels. It was not carcinogenic in rats, but might be in mice at very high concentrations but that the overall weight of evidence indicates that it is unlikely to pose a cancer risk in humans from dietary exposure. The European Food Safety Authority was assessing glyphosate as part of their routine re-registration program, um, and Germany was appointed to conduct the assessment of glyphosate. Um, they completed that assessment and then um, um, basically added to that assessment following the IARC um, classification. So they, they did a more comprehensive carcinogenicity assessment after that and concluded that glyphosate was not carcinogenic or mutagenic. Um, as I said, this led to a lot of controversy in Europe. Um, interestingly, the environmental or the MEPs were quite happy with the carcinogenicity 
um, information, but they have been repeatedly voting not to renew the registration of glyphosate on environmental and endocrine disruption grounds. So whilst the activists are very upset about carcinogenicity, the MEPs are actually um, more concerned about other issues. So on the day before the registration of glyphosate was due to expire in the EU, the European Commission extended approval for 18 months to allow the European Chemicals Agency to complete another assessment. Um, but that, con that approval was um, conditional on removing the um, pro or banning products that contain glyphosate and polyethoxylated taloamines. Mm -hmm. Um, and then minimising, but they haven't defined what that means, it's up to each member state to, def to decide what they want to do, to minimise the use of glyphosate in public areas and to minimise pre-harvest use. Um, and that 18 months will run out at the end of next year. So the European Chemicals Agency was then asked to re-evaluate glyphosate, but they had actually already done that and already published it for public consultation, so we already know what their conclusions are. The European Chemicals Agency is responsible for managing the harmonised classification process in the UK, in the sorry, in the EU for pesticides and chemicals. And like IARC, they only um, assess hazards, but they use a weight of evidence approach in their hazard assessment. They they were asked to look at various aspects of the health impacts and the environmental aspects of glyphosate. And as far as um, the health impacts go, they found that or concluded that glyphosate was, again, not carcinogenic or mutagenic. So this proposal went out for public consultation on the 2nd of June and is now complete, I think. Um, and it proposed to confirm the existing criteria for um, the potential for eye irritation and aquatic toxicity and to add an additional criteria that glyphosate may cause damage to organs through prolonged or repeated exposure. Canada was also in the process of re-evaluating glyphosate. They started that process in 2010 and published their proposed decision in 2015. Again, they conducted a risk-based weight of evidence assessment um, of both published and unpublished data and concluded that um, there were no unacceptable risks to human health, but that new risk, mit risk mitigations should be proposed. And they included a 12-hour uh, um, re-entry interval and minimising or making sure that when you do use glyphosate in a public area that you do it at a time when drift is likely to be minimised. The US EPA was also looking at glyphosate as part of their re-registration process. They started in 2009. They were held up by the IARC classification because they decided to do a more detailed carcinogenicity assessment and they've also been hit by a few additional environmental sort of issues. So they have, they're, they're um, document was delayed. They published their carcinogenicity report a couple of days before we published our one, so our, unfortunately we didn't include a summary of that in our report because we didn't have time to look at it. They also did a risk-based weight of evidence assessment and concluded that glyphosate was not likely to be carcinogenic to humans. Um, they found that where an increased tumour incidence was observed, that it was only seen at incredibly high doses via intraperitoneal administration. Um, which was not considered relevant for human exposure. There was no <coughs> dose response for either the epidemiological or the animal carcinogenicity studies. Um, and that while there were conflicting results for the association between glyphosate and NHL, that the highest waste weighted study, the um, agricultural health study, um, pr presented negative results. They also um, actually discussed how they had looked that, they thought it was interesting that since the genetically modified um, glyphosate resistant crops had been introduced in 1996 and therefore glyphosate usage had gone up, that the incidence of NHL in um, those communities had not increased and in fact seemed to have decreased. And they pointed out that if NHL was correlated with glyphosate exposure, you would have expected the incidence of, glyphosate, of NHL sorry, to increase since 1996 and that hasn't happened. Um, New Zealand also commissioned a review of the IARC um, document and the evidence for carcinogenicity using a weight of evidence approach, again concluding it was not carcinogenic or genotoxic. They were a little bit more directly critical of IARC than some of the other regulators and stated that the um, positive associations reported by IARC were not considered to be reflective of a positive association by other reputed or reputable scientific bodies. Um, they also criticised the conclusions by 
that came from in vitro cell based or cell line studies saying that direct exposure to cells at high concentrations of glyphosate is not realistic to human <coughs> exposure. Um, and they also pointed out that the studies that generally followed internationally accepted guidelines consistently produced negative results and that all of the positive associations were generated from studies that used either unvalidated um, methods or test species um, or unrealistic exposure. So our response to the IARC classification was that we nominated glyphosate for reconsideration ourselves because we figured someone was going to do it, we may as well do it ourselves. Um, and for the chemical review process, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, once a chemical has been nominated, we have to do an assessment to determine of that of the information that supported the, assess the nomination to determine whether a full reconsideration or review is actually justified. Um, so what we did was we commissioned a review of the IR monograph and the associated um, studies they relied on by the Department of Health. As part of our commitment to assess international data, we assessed all of the available international assessments that I just described. And our conclusion was that there were no scientific grounds for placing glyphosate under formal reconsideration. And we published that proposed position on the 30th of September and public consultation is open until the 30th of December. So you're more than welcome to submit something and I apologise if it ruins your Christmas. Um, you can find our regulatory position and the reports commissioned by the Department of Health on our website. Um, we also have quite a bit of information on our website about glyphosate and we have a fact sheet as well. So the way we conducted our assessment was again using a weight of evidence risk-based uh, approach. Um, we asked the Department of Health to assess the IARC monograph and any studies that related specifically to carcinogenicity that they had not already assessed in previous assessments of glyphosate because we didn't want them to be reassessing studies they've already assessed. Um, partly because it's, you know, you're doubling up on that work and partly because we knew it would slow the process down. So um, they were limited to studies they'd not already looked at. We also looked at the risk assessments conducted by international regulators and expert bodies. And we looked at the adverse experience reports that had been submitted to the APVMA. We had a look, when we were looking at the studies, we were looking for uh, specific um, factors that might increase our reliance or um, confidence in the data and also things that might reduce our confidence in the data in order to weight the studies appropriately. So we looked at things like reproducibility and a dose response relationship which is really important, consistency of any effects seen. We looked at statistical significance but we also made sure we looked at biological plausibility because we don't want to just rely on statistical significance when it doesn't make any sense or if you see something that's not statistically significant, but it's a very rare finding. So um, if it's biologically plausible, it might still be relevant. We also looked at natural variation, incidental findings, the test species and route of administration used, and where appropriate, where they were available, the adherence to international guidelines. And for the epidemiology studies, we weighted the prospective cohort study higher than the retrospective case control studies. So our review of the IARC monograph the, was conducted in two tiers. Uh -oh. um, there were 19 references relevant to, the, to carcinogenicity and the conclusion from the Department of Health was that there was no new information to indicate that glyphosate poses a carcinogenic or genotoxic risk. Um, our assessment of the epidemiology was similar to the other assessors that the large prospective study found no effect. The other case control studies reported variable results, but they had a number of limitations, such as their retrospective and therefore re um, dependent on or subject to recall bias. They had small sample sizes and limited power. They often presented non-significantly non increased odds, raci odds ratios with large confidence intervals that spanned one, and often there was missing data. For the animal carcinogenicity studies, again, similar to the other regulators, um, there was no evidence in rats, some evidence in mice, but only extremely high doses. Um, and we also noted the lack of statistical significance in the pairwise comparisons that were presented in the original papers. We also found that um, inappropriate weight had been applied to some studies by IARC where there was no dose response evident, 
um, minor positive results were only reported at extremely high and unrealistic exposure levels and they didn't take into consideration the relevant historical controls. Um, for genotoxicity, I've already mentioned that DNA damage can be also um, an effect of cytotoxicity and where permanent DNA changes um, detected by mutation or chromosomal damage were um, evaluated in well-designed studies, they consistently produce negative results. So the positive results were generally only seen in very high um, concentrations and often in studies that used intraperitoneal administration. So our conclusion was that the weight of evidence indicates that glyphosate is not genotoxic in mammals at concentrations relevant to human exposure. So our key message or messages are that glyphosate does not pose a cancer risk when used according to the approved label directions. Um, and our proposed regulatory position will be available for public consultation until the 30th of December. <laughs> and that's me. Thank you.